Okay. Can y'all hear that when it says it's going to record? Do y'all hear that? You do. Okay. Um, um, okay. Tonight, I'm thinking about uh, talking. Uh, I had a question in um, one of the Mexico churches. On Monday nights, I have a um, uh, Zoom meeting with Dominican Republic in Mexico. And so one of the questions that I had out of Reynosa, Mexico, the other night was concerning Leviathan. And I thought I would talk about it just a little while, but I wound up talking the whole whole hour on Leviathan. And so I thought, well, I may talk about that tonight. I, I may wait till Sunday morning. I've got a whole lot more to say on meekness. And um, so I'm going to work on that probably Sunday morning Bible study. That's what I'm thinking right now. But of course, you know, you never know what might happen and you may never get on what you're thinking. But anyway, I'm really dealing, you know, I'm really studying um, meekness is a, it's one of the fruits of the spirit that I, I have to admit that I, I don't think I've ever really looked into meekness at any depth that I've been looking at it lately. And um, I'm really getting a lot out of it. And so um, I'm, I'm wanting to work on it some more and I'm not sure I can finish what I'm wanting to work on Sunday, Sunday, if we talk on it Sunday morning Bible study. Anyway, but, uh, but tonight I thought since it was fresh on my mind and since um, I'm still working on trying to put together some notes and some put my thoughts on my Bible notes on meekness because I think it's a really, really good good uh, subject and I feel like that this year I feel a really strong importance to uh, work on our personal relationship with the Lord um, and really get the foundation um, of the early church which uh, that early church foundation no doubt was Matthew 5, 6, and 7, uh, Paul's words in Romans 6, 7, and 8, and 1 Corinthians 13 uh, on charity. And so I'm wanting to work on those things and just get rehearsed those foundation uh, teachings of the early church, because I feel like we're getting close to a place that we need those things and we need to focus on them maybe more than what we have. And so I'm really feeling like uh, two things, really working on uh, those foundation teachings and the uh, and working on our, our personal relationship where we're focusing, you know, more on not the mechanics. Uh, that's what I've been calling it, the mechanics of um, of the the church or the body of Christ, um, which are important, uh, which would be standards, which I do not, I don't look at standards as standards of dress only in portion. I look at standards as behavior, Christian behavior, godly behavior. That's the standard that we should have for life, for our behavior. So it, it covers uh, many things and far more than just standards of dress. I've said, in matter of fact, if you make dress a law, and you equate your righteousness by how you dress, you've missed it a hundred miles. If you will 
if you live, if you really live a dedicated life to God, your 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 standards will come in line with the character of God's righteousness. You won't have to have anybody tell you very much about how to dress. I think it needs taught to to an extent, but that's not my hobby horse. Is to try to usurp authority over people to make them dress a certain way and make them think they're righteous by doing that. Um, nothing could be further from the truth of that. In fact, there's some people so self-righteous in their dress that the, in, in the way they dress that they almost stink of unrighteousness because of their so, you know, self-righteous spirit about it. Uh, I, I just... You know, and and I know we have to be careful about trying to tear that down because we certainly don't want anybody to to dress like the world or you know or be lewd in their dress or loose and or anything like that. But I'm just saying that that's one of the mechanics. That order is another one of the mechanics, which is necessary to understand order and how to work in order in the word of God in the Bible. At the same time, if you focus on that more than you focus on your, your personal relationship with Christ through the word of God and the spirit of God, you'll, you will miss it because you start focusing on the mechanics and you lose your first love that's what Jesus rebuked the church at Ephesus over is they had lost their first love. And you, you can, that doctrines in other doctrines, standards, and order. If you start making a God out of doctrine, you love your doctrine more, you know, than, than you love your walk with the Lord. Uh, humility, meekness, uh, you know, that, that those uh, that's what we need to focus on. The rest of it will come in line if we focus on on our relationship with the Lord by wanting and fearing God and wanting God's work, His righteousness in our lives. All, all the the mechanics of it will come to in in place. Um, again. I'm certainly not trying to tear down the mechanics of it. I certainly believe in standards of, of our behavior, including our dress. I, I certainly believe in order of the word of God, and I believe in the doctrine. We're still trying to restore doctrine in its completeness, and, and we have to be careful about, you know, loving our doctrine more than we love our brothers. You focus on that, make a God out of doctrine, you've missed it. It, it what did Paul say concerning uh, when he was talking about charity? Though we how how did he say it? Though we have all knowledge, uh, yet you can wind up just being a tinkling symbol and a sounding brass. You're nothing without the love of God, the Spirit of God that goes with that. You won't. You, you're not going to be much without the Lord, uh, his, his, the characteristics of his um, person being a part of your character or, you know, my character, I'll put it on me. But anyway, uh, I, you know, uh, and so I'm wanting to put a, Focus, you know, I'm wanting us to focus on, on our dedication to the Lord. It's what I'm feeling right now. And, and I'm wanting to focus on church growth this year. I'm really wanting to put a focus on trying to reach out and see if God will help us reach and serve more people that are hungry for the word of God and the way of God. We try to reach them through the mechanics, we'll miss it. But if we try to reach them through um, a dedicated life and knowing the Lord, that that's what will reach people, I feel. 
And so that's part of our focus uh, for the year this year. And I hope that the Lord will help us. We need to be praying about that. I'm certainly praying about it. Anyway, I didn't mean to say anything about any of that. I was going to talk on Leviathan, which is in contrast to everything I've just said. <laughs> so let's look at Leviathan tonight. Uh, here, um, I might start off in um, Job, the 26th chapter. Let me, let me go ahead. I'm going to share my screen. Seem like some of y'all like that. Y'all all still want me to do that? Raise your hand if you like that. Uh, okay. So I'll share my screen here and open it up to you a little bit. Um, <clears throat> here in the 26th chapter of Job and starting in the 11th verse, I think it's it's not, it doesn't say anything about Leviathan, but it, it alludes to it. Um, here in the 10th verse, said, he hath compassed the waters with bounds until the day and night come to an end. The pillars of heaven tremble and are astonished at his reproof. He divideth the sea with his power, and by his understanding he smiteth through the proud. By his spirit, he hath garnished the heavens. And look at this. And his hand hath formed the crooked serpent. Lo, these are parts of his ways. But how little a portion is heard of him. But the thunder of his power, who can understand? So <clears throat> Job's talking here. And... and uh, he, this is part of one of his answers to one of his comforters. One of his, he, he called them, I don't remember, I think he said they were pitiful. <laughs> he wasn't too thrilled about his comforters. But, but here it tells us that God's hand formed the crooked serpent. That's part of his ways. In other words, God did make man, uh, is it in, Isaiah, one of the scriptures that says he created evil. Maybe that may be in Proverbs. Um, so the Lord, um, he, um, uh, the Lord, when he created man, he created man with the ability to do both good and evil. And that formed the crooked serpent. That, that formed, there was definitely going to be wickedness developed through man. Uh, no matter what, how, you, how you look at it, wickedness works in man. That's where it works. It works through men. And um, so, and God did that. God takes responsibility for that. He, 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 he had to make man that way. Uh, to give man the freedom of choice of good and evil. And uh, so God did, it was, he, he did form the crooked serpent. Uh, here in Job 41, another one of his answers uh, here, uh, well, God's, God's talking to Job now. And he says, uh, if you back up to the 40th chapter in the 15th verse, he makes a mention of another, another beast here. Um, here, nobody knows really which what this behemoth is. Here, the, the Hebrew, Strong's Hebrew, is looking at its possibility of a water ox or hippopotamus or a Nile horse. They're just saying behemoth, possibly an extinct dinosaur. Uh, so some have translated the elephant. So we don't, we really don't have an absolute there, but I'm just showing you that one of the questions that I had was, is this, is this Leviathan a really a creature, is a mythological creature? What is it? 
Well, I think these creatures actually did exist, but God did use them as a picture and a type to get a, his point across, and we'll see that here concerning Leviathan. He asked Job, can you draw out Leviathan with a hook or his tongue with a cord, which thou lettest down? Canst thou put a hook into his nose or bore his jaw through with a thorn? Will he make many supplications unto thee, or will he speak soft words to you? Will he make a covenant with you? Wilt thou take him for a servant forever? Wilt thou play with him as with a bird, or wilt thou bind him for among the merchant, uh, uh, for the maidens? Shall the companions make a banquet of him? Shall they part him among the merchants? Canst thou fill his skin with barbed irons? or his head with fish spears, lay thy hand upon him. Remember the battle. Do no more. Behold, the hope of him is in vain. Shall not one be cast down even at the sight of him? None is so fierce that dare stir him up. Who then is able to stand before him? Who hath prevented me Shall I, that I should repay him? Whosoever is under the whole heaven is mine. Whatsoever is under the whole heaven is mine. I will not conceal his parts, nor his power, nor his comely proportion. Who can discover the face of his garment? Or who can come to him with his double bridle? Who can open the doors of his face? His teeth are terrible, round about. The scales are his pride, shut up together as with the close seal. One is so near to another that no iron can come between them. They are joined one to another. They stick together. They cannot be sundered. By his niecing, a light does shine, and his eyes are like the eyelids of the morning. Out of his mouth go burning lamps, and sparks of fire leap out. Out of his nostrils go spoke, smoke, and out of seething, as out of a seething pot or cauldron. His breath kindleth coals, and a flame goeth out of his mouth. In his neck remaineth strength, and sorrow is turned unto joy before him. The flakes of his flesh are joined together. Uh, they're firm in themselves. They cannot be moved. His heart is as firm as a stone. Yea, his heart is a piece of nether millstone. When he raiseth up himself, the mighty are afraid by reason of breaking. They purify themselves. The sword of him that layeth at him cannot hold the spear, the dart, nor the habergeon. The, he esteemeth iron as straw and brass as rotten wood. The arrow cannot make him flee. Sling stones are turned with him into stubble. Darts are counted as stubble. He lasts laugheth at the shaking of a spear. Sharp stones are under him. He spreadeth sharp pointed things upon the mire. He maketh the deep to boil like a pot. He maketh the sea like a pot of ointment. He, he maketh a path to shine after him. One would think the deep to be hoary. Upon earth there is none like his, who is made without fear. He beholdeth all high things, He's a king over the children of pride. Well, <clears throat> it looks like God's describing here a uh, an actual beast or animal, sea animal, sea monster. We don't know really what it was, but uh, when you look at it, like that last word, he's a king over all the children of pride. That's a, uh, you can look at it at least as an allegory of, of what fierce and wicked rulers are like. There's, they're not afraid of nothing. They, you know, they're, uh, they, they, there's not anything they don't think that can defeat them. Uh, now let's look in the 74th chapter of Psalms. Um, in fact, I think I want to back up to see here. 
Yeah, here he's talking about um, it's very possibly during Jeremiah's day um, in Babylon. And the que there's a question here in Psalm 74 and verse 10. Oh God, how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? Why withdrawest thou thy hand, even thy right hand? Pluck it out of thy bo bosom. For God is my king of old, working salvation in the midst of the earth. Thou didst divide the sea by thy strength. Thou breakest the heads of the dragons in the waters. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces and gave him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. Here it looks like he's referring to uh, Egypt when God divided the sea uh, with his strength and he breaketh the heads of the dragons in the waters. Here he broke the heads of the dragon, referring to the generals or leaders of Egypt's army that were pursuing Israel when cross, crossing the Red Sea. Thou breakest the heads of Leviathan in pieces. He's definitely using it as a picture here and gave him to be meat to the people inhabiting the wilderness. They, they crossed the Red Sea and went into the wilderness. Um, but it, the, he's got a question here. How long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name? He's reminding God here in this Psalm that you did destroy, you destroyed Egypt, the dragons in the waters there when they crossed Egypt. You broke the heads of Leviathan in pieces. He's, he's using this as a picture here. And so <clears throat> I, I was talking the other night about how long shall the adversary reproach? Shall the enemy blaspheme thy name forever? There's a question there is how long, God, are you going to let wickedness go on? How long are you going to let God's people suffer? And I referred this to uh, to the sixth chapter of Revelations here. No, no, Revelation six. Excuse me, because I think that uh, it ought to be addressed uh, right here in the ninth verse when the sixth, the fifth seal opened. When he opened the fifth seal. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God, for the testimony which they held. And they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? These, um, change that right there. These, uh, these souls under the altar, I think we we need to, to consider um, we know we've taught in time past that these souls under the altar were overcomers out of the early church, which I don't teach that that way anymore. I, of course, I did teach it because that's the way I was taught it. But we're, yeah, in my opinion, we're very weak on, on uh, trying to make that fit. Because if you take these seals in the book of Revelation that are opened, starting out with the white horse, the early church, the red horse, the falling away of the church, uh, you know, it's red, the color of sin, sin, sin entered in. Uh, the writer had a sword in their hand, which was the word of God, and they had power to hurt men. Without wisdom, the word of God can be hurtful. In fact, we're still, we're still suffering that because we're still in the Red Horse era, and we're still waiting on leadership of wisdom and the right spirit to lead by. I mentioned this recently, and I think it's worthy to mention that 
God's, um, and, and I think this is something the Lord showed me. Somebody's microphone is on. Let me see who it is. There, it was Brother Paul, so I got it off. Um, if you look at the Reformation and all of the organizations that were developed down through the Reformation, and that was part of God's reforming work or work of his Reformation, he couldn't change it from a pale horse to a uh, white horse all overnight or even all at once. And that's why we've always taught, you've seen the pictures in our churches of the horses, the white horse, the red horse, the black horse, the pale horse, then coming out of the wilderness, coming out of that condition, it goes back to a black horse, which is a type, type of, the, of Protestantism. And then it goes from the black horse, it reforms back to a red horse, a type of Pentecostalism. And finally, back to a white horse, uh, the restored church, just like the early church. And so uh, when you look at these seals, you have to recognize that they're in chronological order. The white horse, the red horse, the black horse, which was darkness, ignorance of the word of God. Finally, the pale horse, death was the rider, hell followed after Catholicism. And then when the Reformation started, it started back as a black horse, very little under knowledge and understanding. But then finally, when Pentecost was restored, the red horse, and we're, we're looking yet today for the restored church, the white horse. But the point that I wanted to mention was, is that God granted democracy in the Reformation. It was a dictatorship prior to that. It was, um, and, and I believe God did that. I think God showed me that. He, he allowed that for the protection of the people. They, they, they could vote in, they still can vote in pastors and vote them out. They can still set up um, a council in a church that can, can do that and that rule a church. A pastor don't have full rule in a lot of these churches. We understand that's a way of babbling, but you have to consider that God allowed that to protect the people because they were under such dire dictatorship that the people wouldn't tolerate that once they got freed from that. And they did need protection. And until Brother William Sounders got a revelation of the order of the early church, that democracy where the people rule, many ruled. Um, and there was protection in that. And, um, uh, but when Brother Souders got an understanding of the early church order of the ministry, and we know that that democracy is not the order, the, the, the order of the early church is theocracy, God the head of Christ, Christ the head of man or the ministry, and the ministry the head of the church. You do need to realize that was under a divine order. And when God showed Brother Souders the order of the early church, that's when we went back to almost basically a one-man rule, which created a lot of havoc. It created a lot of problems in the body. Uh, men didn't know how to operate like that. Men didn't know how to operate like the 12 apostles that were righteous men. That's one of the, one of the definitions I could give you of meekness. Jesus was meek and lowly. And meekness is harnessed power to forsake one's own pride to serve God in service for his people, to forsake your own 
your own pride, proudful ways to become a servant to the benefit of others, not yourself. And that takes harnessing strength. I, I used it like this. I said, you take a wild horse, a wild stallion. He's wild. He's powerful. Running about doing his own will. But if you take that horse and break that horse and get that horse harnessed to use his power to benefit, to benefit, not just be wild. That's, that's a, a crude example of meekness where you harness your wild spirit and, that, and it's harnessed and formed to do the will of God, to bless God's people and his work, not yourself. And so, uh, you know, God's still developing a ministry. He's still developing uh, the kind of ministry that we got to have. Uh, I was telling someone today, I said, a, a true leader, in my opinion, a true leader is someone who does not usurp authority over anybody, but they freely give and service and serve God's people and help them in every way that they can help. And then when a person feels God's put a leader in their heart for that leader to be a covering for them, to, to, that they can look to that leader without fear, that they can trust that leader. And that that leader has no strings attached. He's just willing to help. There's a door with no lock on it. You can walk through it and get out anytime you want to. And there's nothing to assert over people, but they have to have a voluntary humility that God puts in their heart to recognize those that are over them in the Lord. There's nobody makes them do it, but God puts that in their heart. And God puts it in the heart of those leaders to serve them with no strings attached. And so, when you look at the early church, it looks that way. You know, there was there was a definite order there, but God put it in the hearts of people to, to recognize those when a man was a righteous leader that they could trust that was there to serve them, not themselves. Anyway, uh, I, I just wanted to mention that God, it looks like God allowed and has allowed out there in Babylon democracy and to protect people, and the, God's people. But that's not forever God's order. That's not what God wants, but he had to allow it during a time of reformation so the people could have some protection. Uh, we, we do have to come to a place of recognizing what God's order is and how to develop it. And God had to allow somebody, uh, and that would be the body of Christ, to begin to work to develop God's true order. But that, that comes with collateral damage. It comes with working and laboring and, and making mistakes, uh, I, I, you know, sad to say, but I'd have to admit as a young minister, I know I've got more wisdom I used to have. As a young minister, I made a lot of mistakes. I'd have to say I probably ran people off. Sister Holly, you need to mute your microphone. We're hearing things. Please, uh, please not, no, you're muted. Let me see who that is. Somebody's microphone, maybe they turned it off. Okay. Um, um, anyway, I just wanted to mention that, um, that here these souls under the altar are in chronological order. That, that, this takes place after the pale horse. And these people, their blood is crying out. Look, look at... Uh, 
verse 10 here. And they cried out with a loud voice saying, how long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And white robes were given to every one of them uh, that they were imputed. Righteousness was imputed to them. They were counted righteous because of their faith and the work that Jesus did on the cross. And it was said unto them that they should rest yet for a little season. Um, a quantity or number, lease or less for, for at least some see a space, uh, a time, not a brief time, a little while. Well, if this took place after AD 538, you know, uh, after the after the the uh, pale horse was set up. So it, it, we're looking for a restored church for God to avenge their blood. It says, here's what he said. Rest for a little season until their fellow servants also and their brethren that should be killed as they were should be fulfilled. What he's saying here is I can't judge this situation right now. And the reason God couldn't avenge their blood is because God had no one righteous enough to judge Babylon. If God would have tried to judge Babylon back then, he couldn't have stopped it. There was not anyone that could judge it eternally and end in the power of wicked religion or false religion. God could have, he could have punished a few people, but he couldn't have stopped it. It would have continued on and it did continue on and it's still, it's still going to continue until the persecution is in even the, the uh, the restore the restored church that we're going to suffer persecution. That's why I'm showing in in the 19th chapter of Revelations. And we're we're, we're not through. We're still working on Leviathan here, by the way. The 19th chapter of the book of Revelations, verse one and two. Now, this follows the 18th chapter. In the 18th chapter, God, in the restored church, in the last prophetical hour, he gets his people out of Babylon. Why? Because he finally has a ministry that's able to do that. With a strong, mighty voice, they will cry, come out of her, my people, that you be not partakers of her sins. I would say that the multitude of people in Babylon won't come out, just like the Judaizers, those in in the Jew, end of the Jewish world didn't come out, but those that heard the voice of God did come out of Judaism, which had turned into a fallen uh, secular group of religious people. When those that heard God came out of that and went into the body of Christ, it was certainly a, a, a smaller number of people in what stayed in there. I think that will happen again that way, but God will get everyone out of Babylon that he can get out of Babylon in the last prophetical hour, the seventh, that's in the seventh trumpet. And uh, the seventh trumpet opens in the 11th chapter of the book of Revelations, and it stays open until the end of the book. That's how important the last 15 years or prophetical hour is. And so um, uh, once God finishes getting his people out of there, he'll judge Babylon. And if we back up here just a little bit, let's just read what he says here. And a mighty angel, verse 21, mighty angel, uh, well, let's look look at the 20th verse because here's where this vengeance, where God venges. He takes vengeance on those souls under the altar as well as all of his brethren that are going to suffer from the hand of false religion 
and the dragon power and the beast. Rejoice over her, thou heaven, and you holy apostles and prophets, for God hath avenged you on her. And a mighty angel took up a stone like a great millstone and cast it in the sea. So the millstone, Babylon's grinding on the word of God, the millstone right now, just like the body of Christ is. But when God gets ready through with them, when he gets his people out of there and he can't get anybody else out of there, he's going to do away with their millstone. And thus with violence, saith the great city of Babylon, be thrown down and shall be found no more at all. And the voice of harpers, musicians, pipers, trumpeters shall be heard no more at all in thee. These are all workers of the gospel in Babylon. And no craftsman, whatever craft he is, will be found no more in thee. The sound of the millstone will be heard no more, heard no more at all in thee. The light of the candle shall shine no more at all in thee. And the voice of the bridegroom and the bride shall be heard no more at all in thee. For thy merchants were the great men of the earth. For by thy sorceries were all nations deceived. And in her was found the blood of prophets and of saints and of all that were slain upon the earth. Now, here's the, here's the final statement of the judgment on Babylon. After these things, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power and to the Lord our God, for true and righteous are his judgments, for he hath judged the great whore and did corrupt the earth with her fornication and hath avenged the blood of his servants at her hand. So here, her smoke rises up forever. In other words, the judgment, you'll never forget the judgment. That's smoke's always after a fire. We'll never forget the judgment of God judging iniquity, especially iniquity into this in the religious and that works, which is a, the work of a serpent. His hand did that. God had to do that. He had to give man that freedom to see which way man was going to go. But God will eventually, but he could not judge this until he got a restored church, a church that had enough power of God in it and were developed to a point that they could judge it. That's why he could not bring vengeance for them. He could not avenge their blood back there that came under martyrdom of the Catholic Church after the pale horse. So <clears throat> let's go back here uh, now to the 104th Psalm concerning uh, the concerning Leviathan. Verse 24 says, O Lord, how manifold are thy works. In wisdom hast thou made them all. And the earth is full of thy riches. So is this great and wide sea, wherein are things creeping innumerable, both small and great beast. There go the ships. There is that Leviathan whom thou hast made to play therein. These wait all upon thee, that thou mayest give them their meat in due season, that thou givest them that get, they gather that thou givest them, they gather. Thou openest thy hand, they are filled with good. Thou hidest thy face, they are troubled. Thou takest away their breath, they die and return to their dust. Thou sendest forth thy spirit, they are created, and thou renewest the face of the earth. Um, here, this is used in, in, a, in a picture of how wickedness actually works and how God, God does. He, he allows the wicked, he allows them to have good things. He, he, he reigns on the just, the unjust alike. He allows them to take the goodness of God and use it as their own meat, do what they want to do with it. But eventually God, they will he, he will hide his face. There will be trouble. 
they will die. They will return to the dust. So, and then in, in this next verse, I'm using these four verses of Leviathan here in, the, in Isaiah 27. We'll, we'll back up in the 26th verse here and show how uh, my point here I'm trying to make is that God, where he said, how long, in, in Psalm 74, how long before you are going to judge these matters? Well, God cannot, he, he cannot judge some matters until he's got somebody equipped with enough of God's righteousness that he can give them the righteous power to judge it right. And so we're waiting on, on an, a restored church to judge Babylon. We can't judge Babylon right now. We don't have, we can't even, <laughs> we got them all around us. And we ain't much we can do about it. Uh, but, but when God has a ministry like that early church, it goes into cities and turns cities upside down just with the word of God and the power of God's spirit. It's going it, to, you know, that's going to bring judgment on those, you know, the Bible showed that uh, in the second trumpet, second trumpet, a mountain was cast into the sea and a third part of the people or many that were in the sea died, I believe it says. How does it say that? Let's look at that before I go back here. Uh, it's in Revelations 7, 8. Okay, the second angel sounded and it were a great mountain burning with fire was cast into the sea and the third part of the city sea became blood. That was the early church. The early church, when they sounded the second trumpet, Jesus sounded the first and he burned up all the green grass, all the flesh was judged. But here, the second angel sounded as it were a great mountain. That was the mountain of Judaism, a mountain of religion, burning with fire was cast in the sea, and a third part of the sea became blood. You remember that Jesus told the disciples and said, if you've got the, the faith as a, as a mustard seed, you can say unto this mountain, be thou removed, be cast into the sea. That's what he was talking about. He was talking about them having enough faith that God, the power of God, would that God's the faith God would give them would give them the power to pluck up Judaism and cast it into the sea. That's what they did. The people that came in the body of Christ, just like today, people in the body understand what Babylon is, and they will not heed to the doctrines or the ways of Babylon. They don't that doesn't have any influence on their life anymore. Once they get the vision of the body of Christ, the early church and the body of Christ today. And back then, that ministry plucked up Judaism's influence that was in people's mind and cast it into the sea. It had no more influence over them than the world had over them. And a third part of the sea became blood. That third part there You'll, you'll see the third part of the creatures that were in the sea, verse 9, and had life died, and a third part of the ships were destroyed. That's talking about people out in the world, God's people in the world, that won't heed to God, and they're a part of that system, beast, system of the beast or whatever day it is. And a third part of the ships were destroyed. That's not talking about one third of the people. It's not talking about 33 and a third percent at all, not concerning the whole of those people. It's talking about God judged everything. 
He judged everything in Judaism back there. But that's when eternal judgment was set up, the judgment seat of Christ. And God judged everything. And there's only three times that there's the judgment seat of Christ and eternal judgment set up in the world. The first time was the early church. The second time is the restored church. The third time is the millennium, including the final resurrection. And so back there, when, when God judged a third of it, a third was in the early church. The next third is in the restored church. The next third is in um, during the millennium and the final resurrection. That God judges the whole in three different times, three different time frames. You remember in the 12th chapter that the dragon, his tail withdrew a third part of the angels. Same thing, same third. He withdrew all of the dragon, all of the angels that went with the dragon system, all of them, wasn't just one third of them, but it was one third of God's judgment over that system. But that system, there was another world, the Gentile world. God has to judge that. And that's another third that'll get judged. Then the, the uh, millennial, down through the thousand year millennial reign, there's another third that will get judged at that time. So that's something God revealed me some time ago. Um, anyway, let me get back now to uh, the 26th chapter of Isaiah. Uh, let's start in the 19th verse, because this is talking about Jesus's day. Isaiah's prophesying of this. And he said, thy dead men shall live. He's talking about the resurrection in Matthew 27, 52. Together with my dead body shall they arise. Awake and sing, you that dwell in the dust. For, the, for thy dew is as the dew of herbs. And the earth shall cast out the dead. Come, my people, enter into thy chambers and shut thy doors about thee and hide thyself as it were for a little moment until the indignation be overpassed. For behold, the Lord cometh out of his place to punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. The earth also shall disclose her blood and shall no more cover her slain. Here is another time. Here's a time in the, Jew, in the divine order of God, the end of the Jewish world, during the early church, that God was able to judge, he finally had a people that was powerful enough to judge the, punish the inhabitants of the earth for their iniquity. Chapter 27, in that day, the Lord with his sore and great, great and strong sword shall punish Leviathan, the piercing serpent, even Leviathan, that crooked serpent and he shall slay the dragon that is in the sea. Oh, God, God judged that system back there, the beast system of pagan Rome, pagan Romanism coupled with Judaism that, that you know, gave the power to Judaism of that day, and God judged that by the early church. And he slew the dragon that was in the sea, and that was Leviathan, that piercing serpent that his hand created in the beginning that developed. It developed into this great sea monster that was used, it's used here as an allegory. There, there, there's evidently some kind of, you know, uh, some people think Leviathan was a big whale. Some thinks he was a prehistoric dinosaur that was a water uh, a water monster, a sea monster in the sea, or whatever it is, we don't have it. We don't have it today, unless and and I won't do away with the fact that it could have been uh, just a a picture, but it does look like God's telling Job there's there's animals like this be behemoth and Leviathan that he mentions there talks about him as a natural animal. So I'm thinking there was some sort of animal that 
that fit this back in their day. They're not, they're extinct today, but the picture that's drawn of this dragon in the sea is certainly still real. And we certainly still have the type of, of Leviathan uh, in um, uh, today in false religion. What did I, oh, I had, I guess I had Revelations 19 concerning the sword. That was the same, you know, of course, that's, that's talking about Jesus and, and on a white horse with the white horse, those that were faithful that were rode with him on white horses. Well, God's going to do that again down here, exactly what he did back there in the end of the Jewish world. In that day, seeing you unto her, a vineyard of red wine, I, the Lord, do keep it. I'll water it every moment. At least any of you heard it, I'll keep it day and night. Fury is not in me. Who would set the briars and thorns against me in battle? I would go through them. I'd burn them together. Let me take hold of my strength that he may make peace with me, and he shall make peace with me. He shall cause them that come to Jacob to take root. Uh, Israel shall blossom and bud and fill the face of the world with fruit. It's just talking about that when God judges that system, God's people are going to flourish and God's going to develop uh, righteousness in his people, which, which was in their, uh, their harvest there in the end of that world. So I'm just, I just wanted to kind of go through the, these scriptures concerning uh, Leviathan that it possibly was truly a, a, a it, it, and I mentioned this other animal, Behemoth, that's mentioned in, in Job, uh, or is that mentioned in Psalm 74? But, but um, uh, it looks like that there were a literal animal like that, but God did use that to show in a picture. They were evidently a, such a strong animal that it could, you couldn't defeat it. Uh, you know, uh, it almost does sound like maybe a prehistoric uh, dinosaur that there wasn't any, there wasn't anybody that could stand against it. You can't stand against the falsehood and evil in religion either. Uh, I was mentioning that. <clears throat> You know, a dictatorship um, what can form into a dictatorship is an oligarchy. An oligarchy is where a handful of, of men rule. We almost have that almost in America's government today, seems like to me, where you it's almost like they have in their minds that the common people are too stupid to rule a country. And so it takes the, a handful of wise people to rule over them and give them what they think they need. And a handful is to rule over them. That's, that's an oligarchy. A handful rules to satisfy their political agenda. You, we can't have that in the body of Christ, but it does, it, it is a danger. And that's what can turn into a democracy. I think socialism turns into a democracy. It starts out where that's what happens. People, the, you, you know, they rule the people by giving them whatever they will keep them happy, but they keep them under total control. That's what socialism does. And it finally will turn into democ a, a dictatorship. It's almost a dictatorship and it's, and its form formation. Anyway, uh, uh, I'm just working on this false wickedness of the, the sea monster, Leviathan. It's definitely the beast that's in the sea. John in Revelations 13, 
in the first chapter. This is a picture of AD 325 when the Pope of Rome was made the head of Rome. Well, John said, I stood on the sand of the sea and saw a beast rise up out of the sea, having seven heads and 10 horns and upon his horns, 10 crowns and upon his heads, the name of blasphemy and the beast which I saw was like unto a leopard that was grease. His feet was as the feet of a bear that was meat of Persia and his mouth, mouse of a lion, which is Babylon and the dragon, Constantine, the Caesar of Rome gave him his power and his seat in great authority. Um, this is where, you know, who was it? I was, I was talking to a man, a man not too long ago. And he said, my daddy always told me, he said, son, I'm going to tell you something in the end of the world, there's going to be a monster come out of the sea. That's going to have seven heads and 10 horns. And he said, when that he said, you, you better hope you're not living when that thing comes up out of the sea and takes control. <laughs> I mean, he, he was thinking this was a natural thing that was going to happen. He wasn't understanding that this was an allegorical picture of, of seven kings and, and the 10 provinces of Rome and, and uh, uh, ruler over you know, evil, over religious, evil religion. A uh, dragon, and the whole world wandered after. And I saw one of his heads that were wounded to death. His deadly wound was healed, and all the world wandered after the beast. I'd like to talk to you about that head that was wounded. I'd venture to say most people have got that wrong. Anyway, uh, uh, verse five said there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemy, and power was given unto him to continue 42 months. That's 1260 days and prophetical day for years, 1260 years. The Pope ruled from 538 to 1798. And that, that beast is still out in the sea of humanity and religion. And it's going to take a powerful operation of God righteous leaders of God that God gives enough power to judge that system. It will be judged. I want to be a part of the kingdom of God when all that takes place. Um, well, did I put that the other night? It kind of came to me like Pharaoh. You know, Pharaoh and his army took off in the, out in the sea. That dragon system out in the sea after God's people. Because when God, when God begins to free his people from that system that that engulfs or in, uh, enslaves God's people. And when God frees them and they get free of that, just like the children of Israel was freed out of out of uh, Egypt. And they, God rolled back the sea. He rolled back the ways of the world and the ways of the, the beastly system of the world and let them get across in freedom. And that system hated them. The same way in the 12th chapter of the book of Revelation, there was, you know, these people that this woman that stood on the moon, clothed in the sun, that brought forth a man child. That was a wonder in heaven, but another wonder in heaven was that a great red dragon fought it, and his angels fought against Michael. That was Christ and his angels. And Michael and his angels cast him out of heaven. And he went to make war with the remnant of her seed. That's us. But <clears throat> when they went across that sea, that dragon, that beast system in that sea went after them to destroy them. And that's what you saw in the early church. The early church freed those people from, from Judaism and the falsehood of the beast and dragon system of that day. And they went after them to destroy them. That's why the great dragon fought against Michael and his angels. 
but God, with his help, destroyed the dragon in the sea. And that's going to happen again down here, saints of God. God's freeing us from this, the evil that has finally come to its plateau in this world in a restored church. And as we flee, God rolls back the ways of Babylon, the ways of this world. He rolls back the waters. It'll be Jordan in the picture, but it's the same picture. The dragon system will, they will try to defeat and destroy God's body. And they'll, and they will, they will try to defeat God's people and God will destroy them in the sea again. Uh, and he'll do it by ministry that'll pluck them up as a mountain and cast them back into the sea. And that'll be the next third of people that gets, uh, that the sea will turn to blood. God will destroy that out there. Anyway, I know that's um, delving into, you know, prophecy maybe in, and that seems to be my gift to a great extent. And so I can't help but, but delve into it. But anyway, uh, if anybody's got a question, you're more than welcome to, I'll stop sharing here. You're more than welcome. If you got a question, you can ask it. If not, well, we'll, we'll try to finish up. But I just thought it might be interesting. I thought it was interesting that they had this question about, about Leviathan in the Bible. These four, I think there's only four scriptures actually with the name Leviathan. There's more sea monsters and dragons in the sea than that. But anyway, I just thought it might be interesting with you or for you to, to, to look into it. And I uh, hope the Lord lets me work more on meekness. It'd be a complete contrast, wouldn't it, <laughs> from tonight. Anyway, um, Let's see here. Who do we need to pray for? Brother Cletus Benfield, of course, passed away. His family, brother, brother McGowan's sister, his mother's sister, passed away, and uh, uh, they're fixing to have a funeral for her. I don't know how old she is, but uh, we need to pray for that family, the Theory family here in Little Rock. Uh, they need our prayers. Uh, remember them in prayer. Um, little Mallory, let's keep praying for Mallory, brother and sister Fisher's new little daughter. Remember her. She still has uh, health issues and will have unless the Lord touches her in a miraculous way. And so we need to keep the Fisher family and this little child in our prayers. Um, Bill Daniels, I'm still we're trying to remember him in every service and asking God to deliver him from this uh, that, uh, congestive heart failure that he has that really keeps him weak and almost incapacitated. He just can't do much. Um, Sister Julie Crafton has been really sick. Of course, she had a stroke recently, and uh, she's doing very well, but she's recently, just this last week, been really sick. So we need to remember her. Remember Brother Goss, I think. Is he still back in the hospital, or is he out? Yes, he's still in the hospital. I was talking to Sister Cynthia today. She was saying they wanted to send him home, but he's still there, and I says, well, what are they, you know, are they fixing him or she wants them to fix him. But I think it's one of those things that she's going to have to accept that it's going to keep coming back because they basically told her what they told her in June. So she's a little frustrated. We need to lift her up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Brother Goss's family, his children, and of course the church there in Keswick, we need to keep them in our prayers. Uh, Brother By, who is been there working with Brother Goss for several years. He was a Haitian pastor over a Haitian church in Orlando before he went to Canada. And um, he didn't have his paperwork 
at the time that Canada had the earthquake and Canada's ambassador, Haitian Tahiti, was a Haitian woman. And she, there was a law that um, Canada accepted people, Haitians, that were trying to get uh, help from and um, maybe embassy from from the from the earthquake and brother brother by would have gotten deported probably to Haiti, but he was able to go to Canada instead. And so he's been there several years working with brother Goss. He's got COVID. Understand, his sister McNabb was telling us he he's he's been in Florida. He's, his church. There in, in Florida, his brother's been taking care of it for him these many several years now. But he's been down there right now, but his whole family, I think, has had this COVID. So we certainly need to pray for that. Uh, I certainly do believe that God is in this in this for the whole world. I think he's getting the world ready for, for a change of judgment. I... I and, and he's not exempted the body. You know, God's dealing with us. And so I think we need to be, we need to be, you know, the Bible says in the day of adversity, consider. So I think we ought to be trying to get closer to God. God may make this thing continue until people start crying out to God and begin to recognize their need for God. You know, for a while you think, well, we can handle this. We'll get through it. You know, they'll make vaccines. We'll all, they're saying right now that, you know, you may get all three vaccines, including the booster, but, but uh, you may, they're, they're saying it, it probably with this Omicron is not going to keep you from get from getting the, the pandemic or the virus, but you'll probably have a lot lighter case and probably not have to go to the hospital or get near sick unless you've got other sicknesses that will, you know, that this will hinder to a point that will affect you, your health. And then you may, you may need medical help, you know, more than just being at home. Sister McNabb just got old, just getting over it. And she had a light case. We're thankful for that. But they're saying this is very contagious. They just found a new variant in France called, I believe it's IHU, I-H-U, that is far more contagious than Omicron. And they're having trouble right now trying to figure that out in France. It'll be in America, no doubt, no time, you know, if, Anyway, we, we don't know very much about it, but I was reading about it today. It's, so we're just, we need to get as close to God as we can, I think. Anyway, let's pray. Let's pray for the churches and, and uh, those that God has us connected to in the body of Christ. More, more connected to, we're connected to the whole body, but we all have a closer connection to some different areas in the body that we we need to be concerned about. Brother Ray Weaver and Susan, do you remember them? Somebody else have a prayer request? All right. Let's all Brother turn around. Yes. Brother Smith, um, Brother Zach. Brother Zach Lewis, Brother Lewis's grandson, him and his father both also have COVID and uh, right after his bone marrow transplant. So it's a really touch and go situation right now. So they definitely, he needs our prayer more so than ever. Okay. So the grandson has got COVID. One has taken this strong chemotherapy for cancer in yes. Norfolk, Virginia. So let's remember that brother Lewis's grandson, the pastor. Yeah. He, he was done with his chemo and he actually did have the bone marrow transplant. He had it. And then just days later was diagnosed with COVID. And so him and, Daniel Lewis, his dad, in the hospital with him, they both had COVID. Wow. And Bridget, the mom, she tested negative. So they like, it took an act of Congress, she said, to be able to get her up there. Um, so she finally was able to go see him because he was definitely missing mom in the situation. So 
He's definitely having some side effects also from the bone, bone marrow transplant. So he's on a whole bunch of antiviral meds and reject anti-rejection meds. So he's definitely feeling just, I mean, just awful right now. So just my heart really aches for them in this situation. Wow. All right. Let's all unmute our, our uh, microphones and pray together. It just seems like to me. Helps me to hear Helps me to hear all. Oh. Uh, anyway. Let's ask God to help us with these needs. Dear Lord. Thank you. Brother the saints there. Oh, God, Lamb of God, meet our needs here in Little Rock. Mexico. Jesus, Jesus, Jesus. Lamb of God, work your work amongst us. Hallelujah. Thank you for your precious work. Thank you, Lord. 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 Thank you, the reaching family, those in Mother Maine, God, that we have COVID in those areas. Help them, oh God, Jesus Amen, amen, amen. All right, God bless all your hearts. Let me, I'll turn off the, the uh, recording.